All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. We are bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and Friday. Plus, there's 50 interviews on the channel now, at least 50 interviews that you can go back and view and see all kinds of cool people, all kinds of cool topics. These interviews are always unedited, unfiltered, just real conversations, which is the, uh, the best way to get to the bottom of things. So today's guest, Kelly Garney, he's best known as the childhood friend of Randy Rhodes. Together, they joined and formed Quiet Riot. He's the original bass player for Quiet Riot, but he's also an accomplished photographer. He has a book out about his life. He has a new book coming out that we're going to get to. This is a bit of a change from uh, the rock and roll books, although it's still pretty rock and roll. So, Kelly Garney, live right after this. All right, let's bring Kelly into the chat. Here he is, Kelly Garney. Jason, how good it is to see you. Same here, Kelly. It's been a long time. You know, yeah. we met here in Las Vegas. I'm going to say, I know. Over time. Well, you know, I'm I'm kind of all over the place a lot. I guess I never wanted to be, but you know, I'm here, there. I just uh, I've been out here about a year now and a little over. And prior to that, I was in uh, Mesa, Arizona, which was a pretty enjoyable city. I actually really liked it there. Yeah, and I feel like so. Uh, you know, I, I put together a band here called Sin City Sinners. Still have it, you know, 14, 15 years later. But I, you, we had you come out. I remember getting in contact with you to jam. And it's been the first time that you played in, uh, in a while. And I can't remember. Was it Frankie Benali and Paul Shortino? Who, who did we have you jam with? I, I remember that really, really precisely because it was a very big deal to me. I, I had a friend visiting from L.A., and um, I got a call from um, Carmen Sorrentino, uh, Paul Sorrentino's wife, whom I've known since she was about 15 years old, so we're very good friends. And Carmen said, um, hey, would you like to come down and uh, play, you know, with the Sin City Sitters tonight? Sinners, excuse me. And... Um, um, you know, my, my husband, Paul's going to sing. And I said, oh, well, uh, gee, uh, that doesn't sound like too much fun to me because I haven't been on a stage in over 20 years. And, and I said, I, I think I'll, I think I'll pass. And, and she said, no, 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 you have to do it. You have to do it. And, and, and long story short, after four or five phone calls between us, she finally talked me into it. And I was absolutely petrified, scared to death mm -hmm. uh, to do it. I was so scared. So I showed up over there and the first person I start dealing with is uh, Todd Kearns. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely amazing and wonderful and made me so comfortable. Set me up with a bass like the kind I'm used to and got me a good sound. And uh, he said, hey, man, you're going to do great. And I said, hey, dude, I am, like, scared to death. I, I'm petrified. And he's like, no, 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 it's no big deal. And this is like some little bar that uh, you guys in that band were tearing up there on uh, East Tropicana. Yeah, the dive bar. Yeah, yeah, the dive bar. And uh, uh, I, really, I mean, I had seen the Sinners, and I thought what they were doing was amazing. I thought they were an amazing band. And I uh, didn't know them yet until that day. And they ended up all being the nicest guys. And I had an amazing time. And even Ron Keel came up and uh, sang a song with us, which was really, really cool for me. Yeah, I remember it being a really cool experience. And it was really fun to get you, uh, to get you back out there. So that's how uh, we first met. And we've been in touch over the years. But like you said, your career has taken you... Um, and your life has taken you to different places. But I want to go back. And now I was saying, Kelly, my goal is to come in in an hour because you've talked about this stuff a lot. Um, and I know it's very important. I want to also talk about what you're up to now. But I, I of course, I've got to go back and talk about your childhood and growing up um, with Randy Rhodes. 
one of the things, Kelly, that I learned uh, from therapy, one of the only things I learned from therapy was that when someone passes away, the way you remember them is up to you. You don't have to remember the bad things. You can just concentrate on good things and because the person's no longer here. And I know it's been a burden at times, but also something important to you to keep alive Randy's legacy. And I know that sometimes um, you, wanted to be your, you wanted to be Kelly Garney, who has his own career and his own life, but you've yeah. always been associated with Randy Rhodes. And also because um, a lot of the people who were associated are no longer with us. And you were the closest person to him growing up. Unfortunately, Randy passes away at just 25 years old. So you have these memories and there is such a, uh, even though you've told a lot of these stories, there are so many young people who are discovering Randy Rhodes every day and people who still want to know so much. And so I'm thankful that you were uh, here to continue his tradition and let people know some of these things about a great player that most people never got a chance to, to see. And I also want to point out that all of these stories are in your book, uh, Angels with Dirty Faces. This came out in 2013. It's available on Amazon right now. We've got a link in the description. So if there's something that we don't get to or something we don't get to in enough detail, um, Kelly really does go into it all in this book. And so I recommend you go down below and, and, and pick it up. So, okay, let's, uh, let's get into it. You grew up in California. You go to junior high school in Burbank. H how do you meet Randy Rhodes? Well, uh, we were new in school, or new to a school, junior high, seventh grade, and uh, all of a sudden we came from our small and somewhat intimate uh, elementary school. Randy was in a parochial school, and uh, he, uh, he, like me, suddenly was in this place where we only saw people we knew mixed in with huge crowds of people we didn't know and it was really intimidating to us because we were both very different than the other kids and we just sort of gravitated not I can't say that we gravitated towards each other because of that because I actually pursued him I, I saw him walking around and I said I said, well, that's a weird looking kid. He looks, he looks really interesting. He looks different, like me. And um, so I said, I, I think I want to know him. And so I followed him around a little bit. And then one day during lunch period, um, he was sitting away from everybody, and which is where I usually ate. And he had two tacos on a plate. And uh, that was exactly what I had. I had two tacos on my plate. So, and he was sitting by himself. So I walked up to him and I sat down and I said, hey, two tacos each. And he said, yeah, they're not bad either. And I said, no, they're actually pretty good. And they actually were. And um, uh, from there, that's where it started. We became friends. And one of the first things he did was invite me over to his house. He told me he played guitar and I said, oh, okay, well, I, I pulled around with a few instruments here and there, but never really serious. And he said, oh, I, I've been playing a long time, was all it said. And my mom owns a music school. And I said, well, that makes sense. And so uh, I went to his house and he played for me and I was like, oh my God, listen to this guy. Nobody, nobody plays like this. I you know, seeing other guys try to play our age, and this was on a whole different level, but the only thing he didn't know how to do yet was play lead. He just played a bunch of chords, and I said, wow, that's amazing. Nobody else I know can do that. And um, so, you know, from there, the friendship developed. Eventually, uh, he talked me into becoming a bass player, and I'm shortening this quite a bit. Um, we got me a bass, and that was right about the time he started learning his leads from the instructor he had, Scott Shelley, down at his mother's music school. And, yeah. Um, he uh, started teaching me little patterns, like three note things, and he'd say, just play this, and then he'd play what he learned over that. 
and we would do that same thing for like five hours. And we thought we were having a blast. We said, oh, this was great to be able to do this. We were playing together, something I had never done. I had never played with anybody else. He had some experience with that with his mom's been, but I had never actually jammed or played music with somebody. And here we were doing it. And every time he went to a lesson, to be honest with you, I can't remember how many times a week he went for lessons. I can say it was several times. It was probably between either two or three. Two or three times a week he took lessons. And every time he went, you know, I, I always say to people, Randy didn't get better every day. He got better every minute. And you could see it. And it was really coming along great. And as he learned, he'd teach me another three notes. And then eventually I knew how to play four notes, and then five, and then a one. And, and from there, it just escalated to the point, you know, where uh, after a year or two, we were jamming with all kinds of people and played. We played our first club in Hollywood. I was 13 years old. On the yeah, you guys, you guys were quite young at the time. It's been said that um, Randy's playing was evolving so fast that his teacher said to his mother that there was n really nothing left that he could teach him, that he had already moved that fast. Yeah, that's, that's how fast he learned. And I know from, from teaching myself, I've never had a student as good as Randy to where I ever said that. I don't think very many guitar teachers have. You know, of course, they want to keep the, the lessons going to make the money. You know, right. But guy he was he was a pretty straight up guy he was very honest and um and when he said that to mrs rhodes when he said i can't teach him anymore he knows everything i know he wasn't lying yeah and so we're going to get into music obviously more but i've got to ask you about this picture right here <laughs> and because this is something that was important to you and that something that you and randy did as kids tell me the name of the uh what you call this device? That's called a flexi flyer. Mm -hmm. They used to advertise it in the back of the comic books. Yeah, yeah. They, they're they basically a, a sled for kids that live in cities. I mean, it's got wheels on it. They're not much to speak of. It has brakes. Boy, those really aren't much to speak of. And believe it or not, I still have one. Yeah, that which is amazing. So I saw this video of you, it's on YouTube where in, in, the, in the more more recent years, you got back on one of these things and I'm watching you go down the, the street and I'm thinking, how do you not get hit by a car? Or how do you not just injure yourself? Because even as a young person, this thing looks scary to me. Well, we were really lucky where we grew up, right behind, like literally right behind us, two houses up, there was uh, the end of a long, long road that was probably about two miles long that curved down a big mountain. And it was called the Dump Road because it led to the dump. Mm -hmm. But it also led to a place called Stow Park, which we would uh, eventually play at quite a bit and where there were quite a bit of high school type parties. And, um, and so our neighbor kid, there, he had one of them, the flexi fires, the one standing you know, to our left, Court, Courtman, and uh, he had one, and then we decided we needed another one, and I don't want to say in my own words where we got it, but we acquired another one, mm -hmm. and uh, now we had two, and they were exactly the same, and so the big thing for us to do was to get somebody drive us up to the top of the hill where Stout Park was so that we could climb down a little mountain, little mountain and uh, with our flexi flyers and then proceed on down the road just zigzagging down this long steep road. Now what, one thing about flexi flyers is they're not particularly fast unless you're going on a very very steep hill which was, this wasn't that steep but after about maybe a third of a mile or so, you picked up some pretty good momentum. And you're about six inches, your face is like six inches off the pavement. And you know, 
that if you wipe out, you are going to get extremely messed up. And of course, we did. In fact, a closer look at that photo reveals that there's blood all over Randy's t-shirt. And that's from when he wiped out on our first run down the hill. So tell everybody, tell everybody who's in this photo and, and where they're at, because this is an old photo. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're at we're up at the top of the hill at Stow Park. That is, that's way in the background where it's green. Uh, Cortland there, as I said, is to our left. Um, I believe the car to his left is his mom's uh, VW Volkswagen. I could be she had a square back. Yeah, I could be wrong. Um, but uh, we could usually get her. Her name was Jackie Alex. And she, she was an amazing woman and, and a wonderful neighbor. And um, we could usually get her to drive us up there twice because it was a little bit of a drive to get up there. I mean, it, it took maybe eight to ten minutes to drive us all the way up there. And then probably eh, less than that to get all the way down on these things. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'll always be grateful to her for giving us that fun because I got to say, we didn't play sports. We didn't play baseball. We didn't play football. You know, we didn't even go near the people that did that because more than likely they'd beat us up. So we just avoided the whole thing. And um, these flexi flyers were one of the few things we did outside of music that were truly kid-like. It was the few times that, that we actually acted like kids and not guys who wanted to grow up and be rock stars which took up 98 percent of the rest of our time yeah and, and and you know kelly it's interesting you say that you will always be associated with randy and with music and with quiet riot but what people may not understand is you were literally kids you know uh to we be, yeah. to be thrusted yeah. into that music business and to expect people to make rational decisions or know how to handle this, there also was no school or template for this. Now bands can follow a form. You guys were literally thrown into this thing as very young kids. And I think that people were aware that Randy um, was a commodity at that point because he was so much better than, than people much older than him. And I think that that becomes an awkward situation. So tell me how Quiet Riot, you know, because I know you guys played in a bunch of bands and you played the parks and the schools and things. So tell me a little bit how Quiet Riot comes about. Well, as you just mentioned, we did have a few bands before Quiet Riot. And right about when I was 15, Randy was always a year older than me because of the school he went to at different grades for different ages because it was a parochial school. And uh, so he was, he was actually 10 months older than me. So he always seemed to be older. Than me. And um, we were, we had gotten a clue by this time, by the time I was 15 years old, that we needed to play more clubs as we had already done. We played not only at, at this weird club, which was our first one, but the other club we played at is, is actually rather prestigious and really only about five bands ever played there. And that was Rodney Bingenheimer's English Disco. That's it, right. It, it you guys five. rehearsed there, right? Huh? Did you guys rehearse there as well? We did, yeah. Rodney was really cool and knew our singer, Smokey, really well. And he let us have the keys of the place. So during the daytime, we rehearsed there. He opened up all the beer taps so we could drink all the beer we wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, and it just was the most gracious guy and really a huge, huge help to not only us, but Rodney Stavis for helping a real lot of bands get somewhere. Absolutely. Huge legend of breaking bands uh, on radio yeah. and countless, yeah. countless legends. How does, um, how does Kevin DeBro get in the mix? Well... We were actually hanging out at Rodney's one night uh, because most of the time we just hung out there. And we knew a lot of the people around there. And uh, one night we were there, you know, until closing, two o'clock in California for bars. And we weren't ready to go to sleep yet. We knew this girl named Hillary and we had been to her house before and she, we didn't really feel like going home. 
So she invited us over to spend the night. And we said, okay, yeah, we'll go crash at your place. And so we went there and we fell asleep or passed out, whatever the case was. Mm -hmm. And um, the next morning I woke up first. Randy was still asleep. Uh, Hillary talking on the phone woke me up. So I got up and I was wandering around. I wandered towards the refrigerator to see if there was something to drink. And um, I overheard her talking on the phone. And she was talking to one of her girlfriends. And they were talking about this guy that her girlfriend met at a concert. And that he said he was a singer. And um, and that he looked like Rod Stewart. And she was sort of repeating everything he said. Or she said. And I heard that. I said, singer that looks like Rod Stewart. Hmm. Well, we should look into that. You know, we were kind of looking for an Alice Cooper kind of guy or David Bowie. Somebody really weird. Not necessarily Rod Stewart, who's actually an incredible guy, too. Um, but anyways, I, I went into her room and I said, I said, hey, Hillary, what's this about a singer? And she said, oh, my friend said she met this guy at a concert. He's a singer. And I said, well, did she get his number? And she said, well, she asked the girl, and the girl said yes. And I said, get, get the guy's number for me. And so she got his number, and we called him up. And Kevin and I differ <laughs> here in what we say happened. I know exactly what happened. But um, sadly, he's not here to argue with me about it. I would give anything to argue with Kevin again. But um, I called him up and uh, said, yeah, we got your number from this girl. And we heard you're a singer. And what's up? What's your trip? You know? And he told me what he was up to. And he was actually playing with uh, what eventually became the Dickies. He was playing with uh, Stan Lee, I guess his name is. It's wild. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it was those guys. And um, he he said, "Yeah, I sing. Uh, you know, I, I got, you know, I got sort of an English look, sort of Rod Stewart." And I went, "Well, eh, you know, that that could be workable. You know, maybe we can get him to look weird or something." And um, so he he invited us over to his house to hear him sing, and we said, "Okay." Now Kevin's version is that Randy walked in with his small little Harvard practice amp that he's famous for owning. And um, he says, Randy plugged in and played, and Kevin was bowled away by it and said, oh, I got to be in a band with this guy. That's not what I remember. What I remember is, first of all, I remember nearly getting killed on the way there in a car wreck. And then we stopped off at a liquor store and we got a bunch of booze because we were somewhat unnerved. And then we proceeded to his house in Van Nuys, which was a, a good sized trek from uh, Burbank for us. And um, we went to his house. We had all these bottles of beer and stuff and wine. And his mom answers the door and we said, yeah, we're here to see Kevin. And she looks at these little kids with all these booze and she goes, Okay, I'll go get him. And, you know, we didn't think that was such a weird thing to do, but I'm sure she knows. So, uh, Kevin comes up, and I I know, I know for me, I can't say for Andy, but for me, I, I took one look at him and I said, this is not our guy. This, this guy doesn't have the kind of look that we want. He just had that black curly hair, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so then we went into his room and he, he played us some videos of him playing with Stanley and whoever else they had playing in that band. And uh, he was jumping around and he was all dressed up and you could there was no sound because it was just straight eight millimeter, not super eight. And so we said, okay, well, that's all very nice. And we thought we thought he looked ridiculous. We thought he was like a fool. And so he said, well, you want to hear me sing? And we said, sure. And he put on some album. I'm not sure who it was. Mm -hmm. It might have been Humble Pie. I 
kind of think that that's who it was because we, me and Randy were already playing Humble Pie song. Um, so he put on that and he sang to it and me and Randy looked at each other and just kind of said, well, I think we should go. <laughs> <laughs> and because um, it just wasn't what we were looking for. And, and we said, okay, uh, great, wonderful. Um, tell you what, you know, we'll, we'll give you a call when we're ready to do something. You know, don't call us, we'll call you, basically. But Kevin was, was really, for some reason, impressed with us. Not because Randy walked in there with a little practice set. Because when we auditioned people, we never played for them. They had to come to us. Never, ever once did we drag our amps to somebody's place and say, this is what we do. I mean, we really didn't have the means to, to do all that. But I think he might have been trying to make the story a little more exciting over the years. And you, it's amazing how much um, detail you can remember, which is we're fortunate that you can do that. So <laughs> I think the way you remember it is probably um, closer to the way it happens. So... Hey, obviously, Kevin's persistent, How, and this is—I'm I'm thinking this is around 1976. Um, 75. Okay, I believe. And um, yeah, he—he he didn't take the hint. Don't call us too well, because he called us nonstop. And back in those days, to call from Burbank to Van Nuys was what they called a toll call, <laughs> and. Um, you know, every time you called Burbank, it costs money. So if, if that showed up on the phone bill, you generally got yelled at by your parents. It's like, what are you right. talking about going out there? That costs 10 cents, you know? And um, so he just kept calling us and calling us. And Randy and I had agreed that we were going to keep looking and uh, that he was not our guy. But he just wouldn't give up, as was his nature. And uh, finally, Randy, he caught Randy, because he had both of our numbers. He caught Randy, and he caught Randy. Randy was not as strong as me at saying no. Uh, Randy said yes way too easily. And he invited Kevin to come over to Randy's house and play and sing with us as we played. And that happened, and we actually did. He had a microphone. Uh, he didn't have a PA, but we put him through Randy's little Harvard practice amp, and that's what he sang through, and we just didn't play all that loud. And we just decided, and we did do a Humble Pie song, we did something like free, I believe, and um, trying to think of who else we would have done. Well, we asked him, we said, but, well, because we knew every Alice Cooper song up to that point, and we said, do you know any Alice Cooper? Cooper? And he said, no, I hate Alice Cooper. Uh oh. And, and we were like, oh, okay, now we are really on the wrong track with this guy because, I mean, we were just Alice Cooper freaks. And um, and that's kind of where we wanted to go, musically even. And um, image-wise, we were already looking like that. We studied the album covers and copied every single thing those guys wore. And if we couldn't find it, we made it. So... Uh, Anyways, he wouldn't give up, he wouldn't give up, and finally we both agreed, well, this guy wants to be in this band so badly, let's give it a shot, and we did, and for years I would regret it, but in the end, just, uh, I guess it worked out exactly how it should have, as far as us becoming extremely great friends and as close as brothers one day. And you made some history. You made some history together. Uh, yeah. Looking a uh, history that's still continuing uh, in, in the legacy. At least. That was not lost on us at all because we discussed, discussed it quite a bit. Yeah, um, it's it's a funny dynamic here too. You know, Kevin DeBro. I don't know how tall he was six two, six three. He was a big guy, and here's Randy, five seven at most. And uh, it, it's a. Uh, it's, it, I think I don't know if people knew that about Randy. I think when you're this legendary, larger-than-life personality, people forget that he was a small guy. 
he was very, very small, but he was extremely strong and could just about beat anybody in the arm wrestling match. That's funny. So, yes. Yeah, and I know you guys had your share of fights. So, you know, yeah. like any young friends and brothers would. Um, you know, so obviously you. Uh, yeah, he's open <laughs> those ones. Yeah, that that that's uh, that'll say it. Uh, I wanted to show a, another photo here. This is another young photo. Yeah, that was my 18th birthday. Wow. And that photo was taken in our rehearsal studio on the Columbia movie lot. And the guy on the right, or to everybody's left, that's Kelly Rhodes. Back then. Well, no, he was known as Kelly Rhodes at that point then. Yeah, he had just changed his name to Kelly from his real name. And then the guy sticking his head through the middle was Kim McNair. He was a, a very, very good friend to me and Randy from, from even before Quiet Ryan. Yeah. You know, and then so, and I'm jumping around a little bit, but I also, I got to ask the, the, the polka dots. When did that... When did that start? Because we see the photos where he has the bow tie and then the, obviously the guitars. The, uh, do, do you remember the beginning of that? Um, traumatically, yes. <laughs> Very traumatically. Only because Randy got what he wanted and I did not get what I wanted because there came a time when the band had progressed to where we had a real management uh, uh, company managing us and guiding our career and telling us what to do and taking care of things and all the kind of stuff that you would think the managers do. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they decided that, that we needed uh, an image enhancement. And um, Kevin actually had a background. He'd gone to school for fashion design. Not too many people know about that either. Um, and he could draw those drawings that people draw to, to draw fashion. And uh, he, there's a book out there that actually has uh, the drawings in them. And um, the management decided we all had to have like a character. We had to have a signature look. And Randy had the polka dots. The reason he had the polka dots is because he saw Mick Ronson and David Bowie um, wearing polka dots. And so he decided he wanted to be Mick Bronson, which was he really wanted to be Mick Bronson. And so he decided to go with the polka dots and he got his way. Drew went with a real streamlined little uh, short jumpsuit, bodysuit kind of thing uh, that was comfortable for him to play drums in. Kevin went with his stripes with yellow and everything. Actually, he was an early version of Striper, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had different colors, but I mostly remember the yellow one, yellow and black, and, and I always think of Striper, uh, who are super nice guys, too, as you know. And, yeah. uh, uh, but me, I really got hosed on this deal, because it was decided, I, I wasn't allowed to have any input on this, apparently, because Kevin had training, and he made the drawings, and what he drew is what you were going to be. And I somehow got pegged a sailor. Sailor <laughs> was upgraded, downgraded, however you want to look at it, to a guy in a baseball uh, suit. I wore a baseball jacket and I had a baseball hat. And my pants had stripes. I'm surprised they didn't make me wear cleats on stage, to be honest with you. But I wasn't thrilled with it, but, you know, everybody else thought it was cute and cool and all that. That was. You know, it was back then, and so it really looks sillier now than it does back then. Right. Yeah, I, I, I can, I can imagine. And, uh, you know, and things like the Bay City Rollers and all these other, you know, groups, and then, uh, you know, the, the uh, suite or, you know, there, there's, in, fashion is a totally different thing. Uh, yeah. So 1977, uh, I'm jumping around, uh, obviously. Oh, that's good. This is... Uh, Quiet Riot's debut album. I'm sure that there's some people watching who aren't as familiar with this. I think most people who click on this do know, but a lot of people know Quiet Riot from the Metal Health era on. But there are two albums that you played bass on and Randy Rhodes played guitar on and that were made first. These records were only released in Japan. To this day, they are not available in America. 
Um, they probably never will be. There is a record called Quiet Riot, the Randy Rhodes years that came out before Kevin passed that he sort of helped to remix, which is a compilation of those. Me and Kevin uh, both did that album. Say it again? Me and Kevin both did that album. Yes. So, and I believe that it was also um, uh, maybe Randy's mother's dis decision as well to maybe not release these in America, that they, they, they weren't, uh, they didn't like his playing as much. Yeah, and you know, that was a Randy thing. Um, it wasn't anybody else, you know. Randy, Randy didn't like what he played yesterday. Because as I said, he got better every minute. But whatever he played yesterday wasn't good enough for today. And so by the time, you know, we actually got these albums in our hands and everything, um, he had already progressed tremendously from that point. And it did show up in the second album that came out, but in, in no way did anything compare to the leaps and bounds he achieved once he joined Ozzy. Yes. Now, now Kelly, are you guys are playing live at this point. You're playing the Starwood. You're wearing your Starwood t-shirt, which I think is super cool. I noticed that right away. Tell me what it's like. Are people starting to realize that Randy is this special, um, but you know, going to be this amazing guitar player? Are people starting to watch him. Well, to be honest with you, you know, people always ask me, you know, what was it like to play with that guy? Did you know, wasn't it amazing and all that? And yes, it was. And then they, you know, they'll ask me, well, what did you think of this playing? And I always say, you know, it just was always good. I, I didn't notice, you know, these uh, things he was always telling me, oh, look, I just learned this. And I go, yeah, what else is new? You know, it, it, it didn't impress me the way probably somebody who didn't know him, uh, you know, it, it would really impress them. But me, it was just, well, that was how he played. So to hear years later that, according to his mother, um, that he didn't like those albums, he didn't want them, anybody to hear them. That doesn't surprise me a bit. Um, that's just how he was. But I can tell you this, you know, when we had those albums put in our hands, and our management was so generous about that, they gave us five copies each mm -hmm. to give to our parents, our girlfriends, our roadies, our most devoted fans, all the people. Yeah, you made it. Five albums each. Gee, thank you, guys. That thing's worth a fortune now. Do you still have one of your five? I do. Okay, good. Yeah, I have, I have both of them. And I have probably other things, too. But, um... Well, Kelly, I... You know, I, I, I can't leave this story out, but you've told it a million times. So you guys are playing. You're obviously not getting along that well with Kevin DeBro. That is not something that you're alone in. He was definitely uh, a figure that got under people's skins, including people who played in the band with him. Quite right. Had many changes and differences with him. In fact, they, they fired him at one point uh, many years later. And Paul Shortino, who we spoke about, um, came in. But before all this, one of my favorite rock and roll quotes, because it's it's insane and it comes from you, and I'm I'm uh, I'm taking it a little loosely. Is I never intended to kill Randy Rhodes. I wanted to kill Kevin DeBro. And this is a story about you and Randy or having an argument about dealing the futures of Kevin. You own a gun. You shoot the Randy won't leave. You're angry. You shoot the gun into your ceiling, not at Randy Rhodes. But you do shoot the gun, probably putting yourself in more danger. And finally, after Randy leaves, you have this idea to go to your uh, studio and you're going to shoot Kevin DeBro. Is, is this true? That is true, yeah. Yeah. But this is true about somebody who had way too much to drink. Let me back up just a hair. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an ample supply of alcohol because the night before I had basically robbed a bar while it was on fire. Mm -hmm. 
and that's all detailed in my book. And, probably, and it's a great story. I recommend people read the book because that also is a great story. So, okay, go ahead. And uh, so, I mean, you know, long story short on that, you know, I ended up with about 15 bottles of all kinds of different booze. And I called up Randy and I said, hey, come on over. I robbed the bar last night. You know, I got all these drinks. And, and he said, cool. And he came over with our friend Kim McNair, who was shown in the earlier photo. And we were all just drinking. And we'd probably been drinking about four hours and having a good time. And I lived in the middle of a barrio in Van Nuys. I mean, pretty much Van Nuys is a barrio, mm -hmm. but I lived in pretty much the worst part of it. And uh, living there, you kept a gun handy. Randy was not unfamiliar with guns at all. Um, we had gone shooting quite a few times up in the mountains. And we had even on occasion, because we could get away with it, because I lived in a barrio, we could go right out in my backyard and shoot the guns off in the air. And nobody ever called the cops on us until one night they actually did. And that's a whole separate story. But anyway, so we were drinking quite a bit, quite a bit. And then we started discussing Kevin, and I said, he's got to go. That's it. He's got to go. I'm not doing it anymore. And Randy said, no, he, you know, he got us this far. Because one thing I will say about Kevin is he did push us uh, to uh, a level that Randy and I could not have done on our own. Somebody had to come along and take these two kids who were making it up as they were going along and show them, you know, the way, give them a way, give them money, support them, you know, do, do what you do to break a band. And that's what Kevin achieved for the band. Uh, were it not for, for that, we probably would have never made it. Who knows what would have happened, you know. But, um, so anyways, yeah, we were drinking and drinking, and the argument started over Kevin, and, and finally, you know, Randy wouldn't back down, which was his nature, and uh, I wouldn't back down, so drunkenly, I said, you know, get out of my house, it's time for you to leave, go. And um, he said, um, no, make me. Well, <laughs> drunk guys, and you say that, I said, all right, and I pulled out the gun, and I meant to do this only to scare him, I pointed it straight up, and boom, it was a 9mm Walter P38, which is worth a fortune now, and I wish I had it, but the cops did it, mm -hmm. um, and I thought, very incorrectly, and I should have known better, I thought Randy would get up and leave, I thought Kim, who was about 10 years older than us, would be the voice of reason and say, you know what, Randy, maybe we should get out of here and he drag Randy out. Well, he did end up dragging Randy out, but it wasn't before we had a humongously huge fist fight that destroyed my entire living room, broke furniture, uh, for all I know, broke windows. I don't even know. There was glass all over the floor. We were rolling around, punching each other. Uh, he raked his fingernail. He, he was famous for having a very long fingernail. Mm -hmm. That was very, very strong. He could screw screws with it. It was so strong. It's crazy. And um, so he raked that across my forehead and took uh, my whole forehead and opened it up and blood just started pouring into my eyes and I couldn't see anymore. And it was kind of funny because my girlfriend that I lived with got up at that time. She couldn't see either, but that was because she sat in front of a sun lamp, a relatively new invention, and wrote a letter and burned her eyes. I had to take her to the emergency room earlier in the day. So she was blind too. So hmm. she's blind from the sunlight. I'm blind from the blood. <laughs> and so Kim did uh, drag Randy out of there. And uh, I wasn't finished yet. I was pretty angry. And I didn't care if I had blood or not in my eyes. I just wiped them out on something. I put on the gun in a shoulder holster. Uh, I put a jacket on over that. I went out to the street to my car. I got in my car and I drove about three inches. And I said, there is no possible way I can drive a car, especially clear down to the record plant in Florida, which was probably about 25 miles away mm -hmm. <laughs> through some gnarly traffic, uh, L.A. traffic. And so I decided, okay, well, this is a really bad idea. 
And uh, so I, in order to park my car, I had to go around the block. And as I came around a, a corner, there was a cop sitting at a stoplight there. I blew the turn and uh, did it really badly. And the cops were probably just laughing and going, okay, look what we got. And I pulled over in front of my house. So did they. I got out. I knew I was, I knew that was it for me. And I opened up my coat, told them I had the gun. Mm -hmm. And they had their guns out immediately and had me lay on the ground. They came up, took the gun off, cuffed me. And next thing I know, I woke up in jail. And that may have uh, saved uh, a, a lot of uh, long run hassles and maybe even some lives. Uh, but it also ends your run in Quiet Riot. You, uh, you did record the bass for this record. This is now 1978. This is Quiet Riot 2. Yeah. Rudy yeah. Sarza was pictured on this record and he's credited as the member of the band, but he did not play anything on this. He did play live with them um, to promote it. The management eventually says, you know, uh, and, you know, you have these older guys. Oh, you know, Kelly's too dangerous. He's trying to kill Kelly. This is too crazy. And ultimately, you're asked to leave. Yeah. Quiet Riot 2 comes out. They're playing a bit. You know, there's more video of this era and things. But, um, again, this record does not come out in America. And it's got to be difficult um, to be playing around, you know, town and everyone else has records out and you only have a record that's out in japan and so this is things are going to move fast because this is 78 the aussie thing comes up right around uh 79 i believe yeah and um and so the story goes that dana strum who is in slaughter now he recommended um, he was hanging out with Ozzy or whatever and jamming, and he recommends Randy comes in and tries out. And there's tons of stories about Randy auditioning for Ozzy. I don't want to go into that so much. Uh, it's been told a lot, and I, it's, I'm sure a lot of that's in your book, and you can find the interviews. But uh, Randy says he played. He doesn't even remember meeting Ozzy. Ozzy stayed in the control room. And uh, obviously Ozzy knew talent uh, when he saw it. And Randy had him make the decision – to leave Quiet Riot. Were you guys uh, friendly? Were you still speaking at this point? I called him up uh, as soon as I got home out of jail the next day. Okay. And we were laughing about it. We thought it was actually really funny. And so and even though you weren't in the band any longer, you did remain friends? No, we didn't know that that happened yet. Oh. We had no idea. We just thought it was we just had another fight. I mean, probably the whole time we knew each other, I would say we had 10 to 12, you know, pretty good roll around on the ground fights, mm -hmm. 10 to 12 fights. And, you know, just kid stuff. And um, normal stuff. And for years, you know, people made a big deal out of it. I, I've had people walk up to me and say, you know, oh, you're the guy that tried to kill Randy Rose. No, <laughs> you know, if I was trying to do that, I trust me, I could have easily done it right across the room. He also uh, isn't the great Randy Rhodes to you. He's your brother. He's, he's your great friend. Randy Rhodes to me. Yeah, he's not, I saw Randy. I've seen Randy referred to by fans, and I take no offense, but, you know, I mean, to them, he's got a, a very unique image for a rock star. Uh, I saw, I've seen him referred to as St. Rhodes. Yes, I've heard that. My first thought was how much that would embarrass him, how much he would hate that. But that's okay, you know. We understand fans. If you've been in this business a lot of years, you, you get, you know, what fans are like and what they do and say. And, you know, good or bad, you just, you know, you never let it get to you. You always appreciate it when they're nice. You know, it's always been that way. And, um, but yeah, um, he, um, people, you know, just took, kind of took it the wrong way for a lot of years. And I really think that my book cleared it up. Mm -hmm. 
and told a good story, but we had no idea I was kicked out. What we didn't know was, unfortunately, uh, Randy and or Kim, I think it was Randy, because Kim knew Kevin as well, um, although it could have been Kim, so Kim, if you did this, um, you know, somebody informed Kevin what had occurred. And when our management heard about it, who we were a bunch of suits in this high-rise CAA uh, uh, building in Beverly Hills, the top office with the best view, you know, we thought, we really thought these guys were the big time. Um, when they heard about it, they were like, that's it, it's over, it's done. I had already had a few little scrapes here and there. I was the guy in the band who got in trouble. Randy sometimes, you know, always innocently. Kevin got in, in a pretty good bunch of trouble one time for knocking up a girl and, and the girl decided to have the baby and wanted money. And that didn't go over so well. Um, in fact, I think he got yelled at it almost worse than me. I really, actually, I really didn't get yelled at for that stuff. They just said, you know what? That's it. It's over. You're done. And I had to go all the way down there, drive all the way down there to get told that. But me and Randy had no idea that that would happen. Like I said, we were laughing about it. I said, oh, they threw me in jail. And Randy and I had been in jail a number of times. I don't even know how many times. Mm -hmm. I say probably six, seven times together for various things that we had done. None of them serious, um, but we didn't think that there would be any re repercussions over this because we thought, if anything, it's it's going to be between me and him, and if the band did, did get involved, you know, I'd be full of I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, I, you know, we had too much to drink, and, and you have to remember, too, that in Quiet Riot at that time, Kevin did not drink, neither did our drummer. And me and Randy were the party guys in the band. We were the ones who, you know, drank a lot and probably sniffed some substances mm -hmm. <laughs> along with everybody else in Hollywood. Um, but they didn't do anything like that. So they couldn't really relate to a couple guys getting drunk and having a fight. They didn't. You know, they, they took the drunk part completely out. And just said, I think Kevin right. would relate years later, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I I always, I never have said it before, but I, I think I'm owed a big, I told you all so, big time by the entire world. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're out of the band. Do you and Randy still stay friends? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. In fact, when we spoke after we found out I was out of the band, he said he didn't agree with it. He said it should have been kept between me and him. Right. And, and that, you know, he was really dismayed by what had happened. And, I, and he was very upset about it. And I said, well, I said, you know what, Randy? I said, I, I just don't even want to do it anymore. And, and he said, well, he says, I'll leave with you if you feel so strongly. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, you feel strongly too. You keep at it with Kevin. You guys will find somebody else. Everybody wants to be in this band. And, um, you know, I, I said, I, I'm going to go do something else. And I'd always wanted to be a fireman. I, I didn't ever get to be one. I did end up working in the back of an ambulance for the next 10 years after that. That's interesting, yeah, and and so um, everything about Randy's life and death is out there. So I don't want to keep you to tell these same stories a million times. And again, your book, I, I can't recommend it enough. People go to the description; they'll they'll get all these answers. So Randy leaves Quiet Riot. Uh, he makes two albums with Ozzy, Blizzard of Oz, Diary of a Madman. He's on the road. I know that at times he's unhappy with Ozzy. A lot of people believe that he would have left Ozzy. Um, Ozzy himself has said that he thought that he was probably not going to stay around. Ozzy was a bad drinker at, uh, at the time. Um, he was basically acting like me, only worse. 
Yes, I can, I can only imagine, yeah. And so... Um, but he was professional, you know, I was just an amateur. And I should point out this time, Kevin DeBro wants to continue and use the Quiet Riot name. He does ask Randy for permission. Uh, Rudy Sarzo is with Randy uh, on that Aussie, that, uh, that, that for Randy would be the final tour. And the uh, so Carlos Cavazzo uh, and is working with Chuck Wright and is working. Yeah, Carlos came in to replace Randy. Yeah. Um, at first it was um, Rudy, but shortly thereafter, um, very shortly thereafter, um, I'm not sure of that timeline because that's just, it's not my history. So, sure. Um, not my personal history, so I, I don't know exact time. Yeah, we we well, got a kind of rough timeline. Yeah, yeah, of how that mental health era is. It, it was was Randy in Las Vegas on the on the Aussie tour. Was that the last time you saw him? Yes, it was. He he came through Las Vegas, and um, because we we still talked. I mean, when he was home. I mean, of course, this is before cell phones. And, right. You know, An email. Nobody's going to call England, or you're not going to get a phone call from England back then. And um, what calls he did make, he made to his mom and his girlfriend. And that was about it. Um, Kevin was a voice of reason and wisdom when it came to the music business. And Kevin actually did get a few phone calls from Randy here in England. Because Randy was so far out of his element, he he was really really scared, and he didn't know what was he didn't know what his future was. He didn't know where this was going. We never liked Black Sabbath growing up. In fact, when I heard when he told me he was playing with with Ozzy, I said, "What are you doing with that guy?" You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> of all people. And he says, oh, well, you know, it might turn into something is what he said. And I had driven prior to that, when I heard the first album, I had driven down to Burbank from Vegas. And I uh, spent some time with him. And he took me in his room and he played me the album. And I listened to it. And even though I wasn't really into that kind of music at that point, because this there was also other types of music going on then, like Blondie. I was a huge Blondie fan. Uh, I loved a lot of punk rock, uh, B-52s I loved. Um, I was really into that kind of music, and that's what I listened to. I didn't listen to all the stuff that was coming out, starting to come out of L.A., like the early uh, versions of, like, Steeler and Alcatraz and, sure. you know, all those guys. Um, I didn't really get exposed to to that too much until uh, sort of the mid 80s. And I started playing again then, and I ended up playing with Mark Slaughter, Mark Slaughter. Yeah, excursion, and, right? Yeah. And um, we recorded an album that was never released. That's actually quite good. Yeah. Um, so it probably will get released maybe someday. I don't know. Um, but, um, that's, Before we get to that, Kelly, let's. Um, what did you guys do when you last time you saw Randy in Las Vegas? What did you guys do? Oh, that was amazing. I mean, he called me up and he said, Hey, I'm down at Caesar's Palace. Come and get me. And I said, Where are you at? At, at Caesar's. And he says, um, I don't know. It's, it's, there's like a big round bar. And I said, Oh, I know exactly where you're at. And I said, Just stay there. And he goes, okay, well, everybody's with me. And I said, all right, no big deal. And I didn't think it was any big deal. Um, I didn't exactly know who everybody was either. Right. Uh, so I, I drove down there. I had a Volkswagen convertible. And uh, I go down there. And this is this is Vegas, you know, in the very early 80s. And, and Vegas still was sort of old school back then. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were in a... Casino, you, you dressed up, you look nice. Now you go to a casino and you see people at back rack tables wearing their pajamas. But right. back then, you know, there was sort of an unspoken dress code. You, you classed up your shit, to, you know, to, 
to go into any casino, even at night. And um, I go there, and Randy's wearing this little teeny pair of shorts. He's got some tennis shoes on, or sandals, sandals it was, and no socks. And he's wearing this cutoff t-shirt that shows his whole belly, and that's all he's got. And I looked at him, and I, the first thing I said to him, I said, you can't dress like that around here. Mm -hmm. He goes, well, I don't know where my clothes are. I go, what do you mean you don't know where your clothes are? And he goes, well, they're on a bus, and, and I, don't, I don't know if they're in my room or what, you know. And so I said, well, where are you staying, here? And he said, no, no, we were, we were going to go to a show, but I don't want to go. I'd rather go somewhere with you. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's go some places, but we've got to get you some clothes. And, and we decided to go over to, uh, I'm pretty sure it's not there anymore, but it was a, sort of a non-gaming hotel. I'm sure you'll remember it, called the Jockey Club. I, I know and, the name. It's before my time, but yeah. Yeah, that's where they were staying. So we went up to his room, and his clothes weren't there yet. Um, presumably, they would have been put in his room in a suitcase or whatever. And so I said, well, if you want to go out, we got to get you some clothes. And I said, guess what? I have some clothes I borrowed from you that I never returned. So we'll just go to my house, and, and I'll give you those clothes, and you can wear those. And he goes, okay, good idea. So we, we drove to my house, and uh, which was about uh, 15 minutes from the strip, the cater, oh, my fashion show mall. And um, I lived in a three-bedroom house by myself, and um, I, I went and got his clothes. I knew exactly where they were, and I said, well, here you go. And he put those clothes on, and he even gave them back to me before he left. <laughs> but... Um, so then we went out, and I said, well, well, what do you want to do? Well, I should back up a little bit here, because he said something a little bit profound. He was sitting in my living room while I was looking for the clothes, and he was just looking around at everything, the way I decorated it. And I, and I do have a little bit of a flair for decorating. I like to do it. And, and so my house was pretty cool. And he said, man, I would give anything to live like this. And I said, really? I said, well, you will someday. You know, at that time, he still lived at home. He never had a chance to live on his own. Yeah. So, anyways, we left. And I said, so what do you want to do? And he says, well, on the way here, I kept seeing all these signs for these buffets. And and I want to go to one. And I go, you want to go to a buffet? Hmm. And he says, yeah, they look like so much fun. And the food looks really good. And he says, well, they're okay, but they're not that great, you know. I mean, not good like jack in the box because we used to love jack in the box but <laughs> i said okay let's go and i don't remember which ones we went to but it ended up he didn't want to go to just one because we go to one it was like 2.99 or something a person for all you could eat mm -hmm. and um and we ate a little bit there and then he said i want to try another one to see what their food is like and i'm like oh my goodness okay so we go to another one. I, I do know we went, we, the two, I know we went to three hotels and went to the buffet in all three of them. And that was the Riviera, the Tropicana, and Circus Circus. But there was a fourth one in there, and I don't remember which one that one was. Two of those uh, are still there, amazingly enough. Yeah, yeah. And uh, amazingly, yeah, they are still there. Well, the, the Ribby's now. But, um, uh, anyway, so yeah, we ended up going to four buffets, and the food was exactly the same in all of them. And I said, see, see, it's not different. It's not different. Mm -hmm. said, well, let's try another one. You know, like, oh, my gosh, are you eating full yet? You know, because we didn't eat that much while we were at these. We just sampled what looked good. And so we had, like, dinner in four places in one night. How, how funny did, did you go see the ozzy show i did yeah he uh, he told me that um they were they were playing that night and were doing all this wow and he said um he goes okay i have it all arranged for you you'll just show up backstage they were, they were uh, playing at the aladdin theater uh, that they had out back there, which I sure hope is still there because it was a beautiful place that, and 
had a lot of really cool concert setup. Um, but that's where the show was. I have no idea who the warm-up band is. I probably should know, it, but I don't. But whoever they were, I, I didn't watch them because I was hanging out with him backstage. Right, you didn't really get to see it, yeah. And when I first got there, I showed up backstage and I asked at the door. I said, well, Randy's expecting me. He left my name there. Uh, I brought a girl I was seeing at the time, who I still am friends with to this day, and she was only uh, 16 years old at the time. And I took her to this concert with me. And uh, the first person I encountered was uh, Sharon Osborne, and she said, oh my God, Kelly, I'm so glad to meet you. Randy talks about you constantly. I've heard so much about you. I feel like I know you and all this. And I'm like, oh, wow, cool. And she's giving me hugs and everything. This is just great for you. I got to, Kelly, I got to ask you. I got to cut you off and ask you because this comes up so much. Did Randy tell you that he had an affair with Sharon? She was Sharon, uh, uh, she wasn't Osborne at the time. And Ozzy was trying to reconcile with his first wife. Uh, does Randy tell you this now legendary story? Randy never mentioned it to me. Um, to be honest, we, we didn't really have girl kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. He did. Maybe I did. Maybe, you know, I scored something the night before that we both thought was pretty good or something. You know, I brag, you know, where. He was sort of a uh, you don't kiss and tell type, and he, he kept all that very private to him. I so I don't know anything about all that from Randy's point of view. Gotcha. It wasn't that kind of conversation. Yeah, it was not. And I do know what Kevin told me because he got a phone call about it from Randy. And the only thing I can say about that is I'll never divulge what. Hmm. Yeah. So that. So there are still some secrets. I know Sharon wrote something yeah. in her book, but probably not. Uh, uh, not what you heard that night. And so we'll we'll let the mystery uh, surround that. Be, uh, before we continue, I have to mention the opening band that night. This is a pretty big, a big one. Motorhead was the opening band. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had. That, that's so interesting because I didn't even see those guys backstage. Yeah, they had a little bit of a career of their own. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, mean, I heard I heard people playing on the stage, but I wasn't listening. I was hanging out with Randy. Right. And, and we actually went outside because it was noisy in there, and so we were talking out there the whole time. But um, you know, Sharon was great to me that night. She gave me a choice. She said, "I have two seats for you. They're in the very front row, center, or." You can sit backstage here. I'll have them bring some road cases over, and you guys can sit on those. And I said, I said, well, I'd rather sit backstage here. And so she set me up uh, right next to Randy, and he was maybe 15 feet away from me for the whole entire show. And kept looking over and making faces, and we're, I was trying to make them laugh. And there was a girl probably sitting in the seats that were for me, and she kept lifting up her top, and we were laughing about it. You must have been proud, you know, to see your friend on the big stage doing, you know. I was, I was, yeah. And I, I thought, you know, he was amazing out there, but I'd seen him do that so many times that it was just, mm -hmm. oh, that's just Randy. You know? The world was seeing what you had already known. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, we're, we're past the hour, Mark, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. I want to close the, the book on, on, the, on the Randy stories. Unfortunately, everyone knows that uh, March 19th, 1982, Leesburg, Florida, um, Randy dies in a plane crash. It, this yeah. Is, yeah. I, I mean, it's a ridiculous story to say the least. This is not a, uh, uh, as far as what happened, you know. Uh, yeah. And, um, and so, the, uh, you know, the, the, the story's out there. Everybody knows it. It's, it's, it's tragic. Um, how do you find out that Randy's passed away? Well, um, it's always hard for me to talk about that, but I can, uh, because I've had to do it so many times, but, um, I found out in kind of a weird way. There's worse ways I could have found out, I'm sure. But the way I found out was I was at work and I had this friend who's 
sister I was dating at the time. And he called out to my work and he talked to the son of my boss who, and my, you know, that guy, they, the two of them knew each other. And he said, he said, tell Kelly that after work, come down to my house right away. And luckily, uh, I'm not one to drive around and listen to the radio. Uh, rarely do I listen to music while I drive, very rarely. Um, and this day was, was no exception to that. And I only mention that because that's how Randy's girlfriend, Jody, at the time. Yes. She um, heard Aussie music playing as a tribute yeah. to him. And yeah. It's terrible that um, she had to find out that way. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, so I get the message. I have to go to this guy's house after work and come there immediately. And I thought, well, um, you know, maybe something happened with his sister. That, that's what I thought happened. And I was kind of expecting something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And so I walked in there and he took me in his room and he told me. And I pretty much lost it. I couldn't believe it. I knew it was true because people just don't say things like that to you. And um, it was it, it was pretty tough. And I said, I want to go home right now. And so he came with me in the same Volkswagen bug. And we uh, went to my house and he couldn't even console me at all. Not at all. I just laid in bed. My friends stayed out in the living room. My mom, for some reason, showed up. I don't know how she knew to show up. She lived somewhat close by. And she tried to, you know, make me feel better. But that wasn't going to happen in this situation. And so the first thing I did after I was able to gather myself together enough to even talk to anybody, uh, I called down to the Rose house and um, I spoke with uh, Kelly Rose and it didn't, nothing sounded too good going on down there. And I said, well, I'm coming down there right now. And me and my friend left Vegas and we drove here down to the Rhodes house. And it was, it was real strange. I know that there was a couple of people sitting in the corner and I don't have any idea who they were. The neighbor, Jackie Alex was there. Kelly was there, and um, Kathy was there. Her husband wasn't there uh, because he was in Florida dealing with that incident. And um, so I was there all night. Me and, me and Kelly split up at the Jack Daniels at our famous counter in the Rhodes house. Yeah, I, and I, yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing it. I know that, you know, you're able to do it because you've told it so many times, but obviously this is not something uh, that's going to get easier. And it's um, such a tragic loss uh, of a friend for you and not, you know, not just to the rest of the world, this, this iconic figure, but to you, someone that really was a brother. And so, um, yeah, you know, no one can imagine what it's like for you to go, to go through this, and for the, you know the other people who knew him, his family, and for uh, you know his bandmates who, you know, for the most part witnessed that plane crash. Um, uh, tragic. I couldn't even comprehend all that. I couldn't even fathom all that because we really didn't know all the circumstances yet. Mm -hmm. We barely even knew what kind of a plane it was at that point. We just got told it was a plane crash and he was killed. And that's all we knew. We didn't 
really know anything until Kathy's uh, husband called later and, you know, gave, you know, the specifics. But, you know, I stayed there until well after the sun came up. None of us went to sleep. None of us got, so we may have drank all that booze, me and Kelly. We didn't get drunk. We actually couldn't. Is, uh, is, uh, is, is Randy's girlfriend at the time, is she still living? Who now? I'm sorry. It, uh, Randy's girlfriend at the time, um, is she still living now? Yeah, yeah. And so she's, is she part of the sort of, because I know there's a lot of hist- ra- ra- events and things towards Randy. Is she involved in that or is she private? She was not there. And, and yeah, she, she's very private. She moved on. I actually read something earlier today. Somebody put a quote from her on uh, Facebook that she had said in a book. And, uh, you know, and I felt pretty bad for her because she and I used to be real, real tight, real good friends. And when Randy was on the road and I was working ambulance, um, I didn't have my meetup with Bud back then, but I did have a motorcycle. And I would often ride to her house and just hang out with her. And sometimes over there I would talk to Randy on the phone if he happened to call that part of the year happened. Because I didn't go there that much. But um, we talked quite a bit on the phone back then. And kind of since I've had a falling out. And that's all detailed in my book as why is of that. Okay. And, you know, to be honest, she could call me up today, tonight, and say, hey, you know, let's be friends again. And I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm all about peace, man. You know? Especially I, this many years later, you know, we're all on borrowed time. Unfortunately, some of us taken sooner, but uh, things that once were big issues, they, they suddenly shouldn't be such big issues. Now, obviously, she's a private person. The difference is you're a public person because you played on these Quiet Riot albums. You're a musician. And so you are left with sort of um, the, the a little bit of keeping the legacy going. And you've done an amazing job at doing that. I want to show uh, Randy's final resting place. I know on the anniversary you go out and you meet the fans and people and you take your time to tell stories. And I know this is something so important to those people. It keeps Randy's spirit alive and it makes this sort of a sacred place as well for fans who go all the time, you know, not just on his uh, birthday or anniversaries. But uh, people get to see this beautiful uh, resting place for, uh, for Randy. And we should also mention that this year, Randy Rhodes has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As well he should be. Which, it, what an amer- amazing honor and a surprise, I think. I mean, you must have been surprised as well. Well, you know, I always see everybody bitching about how, oh, they should put Judas Priest in there or somebody, you know, why, why isn't this band in there? That's eh, not about rock and roll anyway. It's all, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is bullshit, and, you know, all this. And, you know, I, I see all those posts. And I've been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And me and Kelly Rhodes had to go out there and look at a place uh, where they were going to do a, a small display of, of Randy for a short time. They change them out all the time. And there had been a bad experience with one of his guitars put on display at a college, and the sun got to it and cracked the finish on the guitar. And Mrs. Rose was very gun shy of uh, letting anybody put it anywhere, even the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. So we went and looked at this very spot. It was a blank spot on a wall, and they were going to put an outfit of his and one of his guitars and some pictures. And she wanted us to go and see if that would be okay. And we looked at it, and we took pictures of it for her, and it looked okay to us. And she decided it would be fine, and, and, and so he was on display there for a while. But to, to be inducted finally is, is long overdue. Uh, I've never, you know, you, you've seen, you know, the Jim, Jimi Hendrix fanatics and the Justin fanatics and Tom Morrison virtually anybody else who's passed away before their time. But Randy, maybe maybe because I just see it really in my face. 
I mean, I, I scroll through my Facebook, and every other thing is a picture of Randy or a picture of Buzz and Quiet Riot. And it's almost overwhelming, you know. And I got to say, you know, I have so much gratitude to the fans uh, for keeping him alive in that way. He's alive through them. Uh, he left them with a great legacy. He left them with some very inspirational material and music that people are using to learn and become something themselves. And it's pretty hard to find a famous guitar player these days that doesn't say, well, Randy was an influence. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And and so, Eddie's a badass. Yeah, for sure. So I think this is a, a, a fitting way to, to sort of close on his legacy that he's being honored in the Rock Roll Hall of Fame. And whether people like the Hall of Fame or not, it, you know, this is one for the good guys and one for the rock and rollers, you know, because yeah. they got one in there that really uh, it, it is close to home for anyone who, who enjoys rock and roll music, you know, the real stuff. So, OK, I, I, I got to. Uh, I got a few questions we got to clean shop on, and then I'll let you go. Big question I've wanted to know, where the hell is Drew Forsyth? What has happened to the original drummer for Quiet Riot? He's the only Quiet Riot member that I think no one knows about. Yeah. Well, you know, Drew, Drew continued on after uh, Quiet Riot with his own band network. And... Uh, I'm not very close with Drew. I never really was, even though we grew up in the same town, went to the same school, and we're in not only Quiet Riot together, but we were also in another band prior to Quiet Riot with Drew. So you would think me and this guy would be best friends, but but you know, he, he just never was really my kind of people. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a decent guy. Uh, to me and Randy, he was the greatest drummer we had ever seen. We were honored to play with him. Um, and him, him and Kevin went along, you know, without Randy. Of course, they could easily get by without me. Uh, but once they lost Randy, it was pretty much the show was over, literally. And, uh, and then there was, uh, and I write about it in my book, uh, Kevin and Drew had a hilarious falling out. Up just really, really despising each other. No big surprise. Right. Um, but he lives in Hawaii. He's a realtor over there. His mother was a realtor in Burbank and did extremely well to where he, you know, was able to live pretty well as a teenager, whereas we didn't. And um, um, I don't talk to him ever, not even chatting or messages or anything like that. The last time I talked to Drew was I called him up and I told him Kevin. Okay, yeah. And that would have been in uh, 2007 that Kevin DeBro passed away. It seems like uh, Drew is a pretty private person. He's not talking yeah. about his career. He's moved he on. not want anything to do with all this. Yeah. I mean, one failed movie guy that I write about in the book who is the worst thing to ever happen to any of us, let alone Randy. Um, he did manage to go over to Hawaii and uh, interview Drew, who really didn't have a lot of nice things to say. Uh, although I saw a lot, if not most, of the footage that he was shooting for this movie, because I'd go down to L.A. for uh, a couple days. I had a girlfriend down there, and I'd drive down there, and I'd go over to this movie studio, and I'd have a meeting with the guy and say, well, let's see what you got, you know, and he'd show me what he had filmed, and I never got to see what Drew said, but I, I asked the guy, and this was probably the most honest thing he ever said to me, because everything else was a lie, but I asked him, I said, what did, what did Drew say in this interview, and he summed it up really interestingly, he said, well, he said it was about 75% bad about Kevin and about 20% bad about Randy and 5% bad about you. You did pretty good then on those odds. I, 
I'm okay on the Drew scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why he doesn't want to talk. Maybe he's one of these guys who feels like if I have nothing nice to say, I'll just uh, stay out of it. And, you know, you've you've been, you know, really able to keep doing these things and telling these stories. And, and you know, you have your own brand um, that we're going to get into uh, right now uh, in just a second. So maybe some people don't want to handle this sort of uh, public li uh, lifestyle. He does so, not. And I don't blame him. You know. Yeah, it's it can take a toll on you. So uh, we know that in later years, you and Kevin DeBro became friends. I want to make sure that everyone knows that. Even though you had that falling out, you guys really became buddies over the years. You yeah. shot photos. Um, you were, you're a photographer, professional photographer. You shot photos for Quiet Riot. Um, and mm -hmm. you would, you know, and when they would play in Vegas, you'd see the guys. You knew Kevin. And, uh, and so Kevin's passing is a whole nother story. I think we've talked about we told enough uh, sad stories for the day, so we'll let yeah, that one go. Because Kevin was actually tougher for me. And I'll tell you why. You know, it's um, it's harder for me to talk about him than it is Randy. Maybe maybe it's because I, I just had to do it for so long, for so Randy. And for me, you know, Kevin's still very much an open woman. And I, I, I've come to believe that when you hate someone so much that you just want to kill them, <laughs> and maybe even attempt it, um, and then time passes by, and you end up becoming great friends, and you see something that made you realize, wow, I really missed a lot, you know, not being friends with this guy, not getting along with them. I should have been a little bit more tolerant, but I was a little kid, you know, yes. I was growing up and all I know is this guy wanted to tell everybody what to do. And prior to that, nobody really did that to me. Randy. And I thought he was an asshole. And again, like I said, the world, world owes me a big I told you so. So, um, but he's harder for me to talk about because, because that one really, really hurt because of the way it went down. Well, and and it's obviously fresher, um, you know, that's one thing. And you, you, you know, you lived in Las Vegas, so did Kevin. And, you know, it, it's very sad that Kevin was, um, it was, it was around Thanksgiving and Kevin was home and deceased for five days that, you know, and it's, it paints a very lonely uh, a, a story, obviously. And, the, the dive bar that you played at with Sin City Sinners, Kevin literally lived across the street, you know, over the walls where he passed. Um, and he was a fixture here in Vegas. He was everywhere. If you went to a club, Kevin was there and he was very approachable uh, as well. And he was supposed to play with us. I have some uh, MySpace messages maybe or emails that he wanted to come out because he loved to jam and he loved to do that. He didn't love to do that. Yeah. And it just didn't, uh, and and it didn't just, it just didn't happen. Um, and then we had Frankie Benali come out and play right after. You know, he, at that point, he didn't think he was going to play Quiet Riot music, or he didn't know. And so, but he came and jammed, and he wanted to play other music. I think maybe he was waiting to feel it out, and sort of try to figure a way to do it respectfully. I've got to ask you the question. I asked Carlos Cavazzo, who was on a few weeks back, and a good friend of mine. How do you feel that there is a band called Quiet Riot that tours right now? And I think I know your answer, but um, that has no members other than maybe Chuck, who played a few songs on the Metal Health record. They ended up taking Rudy Sarzo back after Randy passed, after the plane crash. Uh, Rudy came back and was the full member of Quiet Riot. So there is a band right now that has no original members of Quiet Riot. How, how does that make you feel? Well, here's what I always tell people, because I see a lot of smack talk about Choir Riot, and, and not only them, but other bands, too, that, you know, are, are limping along with some guy that was in the band for five minutes, and so they bring him back, and they say, hey, he's an original member, mm -hmm. you know, and so now we're still Leonard Skinner, or whoever's out there doing that, and the way I always explain it to people is, is I say, look, you know, it's like a sports team, you know? One of these days, Tom Brady is going to be playing for this team that I like, and, and you know, 
or they'll retire or something, you know. And so I say, bands are like that too. They can have revolving doors. There's new players. It's just like sports, you know. And um, just because you know the, you know, a guy leaves, that doesn't make the brand of the band dead. It's still a brand. It's still a style. And more importantly, more than anything else, it's still that music. Mm -hmm. And these guys, Chuck especially, has been playing these songs a very, very long time and done a lot of touring. And Chuck has put his heart in that band and has done a phenomenal job. Of course, he's not as good as me. But <laughs> yes. Alex well, is good. Well, Alex I I think one of the arguments from fans, and it might not even be that reasonable, is that you have Rudy and you have Carlos. You have 50% of that famous lineup that are still alive. And you have Paul Shortino who sang on an album. And, and this is no disrespect. You know, Jizzy Pearl's a friend of mine. You know, he's, he's sings with Sin City Sinners. And so, uh, so I think fans sometimes would like to see that, but that's not necessarily the way it goes. And Frankie... Had, uh, and Carlos did not get along, and Frankie had his own way of handling things. And so they are continuing the brand. I will say Carlos's answer to what he thinks is that he said it's stupid, that, that, that it's continuing. But he's also more involved, and I can understand he, he has that personal situation. Now, for you, if those guys asked you to come out and, and, and jam a, a song, uh, would you do it? Well, actually... As a matter of fact, uh, I've talked with Alex about this, and, uh, you know, Quiet Riot now is trying to book shows and tours, as every band is, and because of COVID and all that, the situation is very fluid. You're seeing bands adding shows left and right. They're trying to get a show on Fremont Street, and Alex and I talked about me coming up and uh, doing a song, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. And it'll be oh, great. Week on stage with Quiet Riot in 43 years. How incredible, yeah. I mean, you you are the uh, sole original guy, you know, to do that. And I think it's great for their legacy and their history. You should probably play Slick Black Cadillac, I would think, but. And that's the song that we're doing because this yeah. song was actually written about my dad. Yeah, that you played on the album, the original music and uh, it's, it survived all, all that time. So I think that's great. Let's let's uh, I'm so glad that you indulged me on this. I know we went over a bit and I know that there's but I've learned there's people who are new to this every day, even though we think we've told these stories. It's like uh, uh, there's people who discover it all the time. You're, you're uh, let's talk a little bit about your photography. First of all, again, I got to mention the book Angels with Dirty Faces. Link is below. They can buy that. So if you want to hear about the rock and roll and your career as a photographer and everything else that's in there. But you have a new book that you're going to try to put out in the fall. And this is a book purely of your photography. It's called Vegas, the 90s Nude. And this is a book of nude photos. And this isn't a Hustler or Swank or, or any of those other outdated magazines. I, I've seen some of the photos. These are very tasteful photos. And um, the nude is not just the, the subject. The backgrounds that you chose and the way you chose to, sh to, to shoot these photos is what tells the story. And it tells the story of a lost time. So tell me, were you always planning on this, making this book? And what made you decide now it was the time to release it? Well, I've always wanted to do a book on this because that was an interesting time in my life. I had an absolute blast during the 20 years I was a photographer. I thought I'd do it the rest of my life, but digital pretty much uh, took mm -hmm. care of that and made everybody and their brother and cousin a photographer, and so there was right. too much competition to be in business anymore. But uh, somehow along the way, I didn't start out as a new photographer, but that's it seemed I had a, a, a talent for it, and I was very well known for it in uh, Las Vegas. I had quite a name for myself particularly amongst uh, all the um, hookers and the strippers and that part of 
Maybe. Yeah, and you don't mean that disrespectfully. That is, no. you chose. You and I both know those are legitimate jobs in this town. Yeah, and you. So the, the, these people were subjects, you know. So I don't, I don't want people to think that you're referring to models as hookers. You actually were photographing some of these women of the evening here in Las Vegas, people who danced in clubs. So it's not that you're being disrespectful. That is some of what the people were doing. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were actually really good subjects. And uh, that was that started happening right when the internet started, and they needed uh, websites, you know, in order to attract customers. So they needed good photos, and I was the guy doing them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, I've done sometimes ten or twelve girls in that business a day, and I worked. For... Photographed. You wanna you wanna say photographed? You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Gotta be so, careful. Although, no. Um, that's a whole separate book, Kelly. Yeah, that's a separate book. Um, you know, and I, I worked for the, the major brothel, Sherry's Ranch, uh, Chicken Ranch, Sherry Patch Ranch. Uh, uh, really interesting being able to work in that world because now it's, a, it's as much as all these, for lack of a better word, hookers, sometimes I feel bad calling them that, but that's what they call themselves. Prostitutes. Uh, I don't know. Prostitutes. Yeah, they also uh, they have uh, oh they they call themselves uh, GFE girlfriend experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were all super cool. They were usually really smart, and they were you know, normally very beautiful. And uh, some weren't, but uh, that's okay. But um, you know they were they were really great to have as friends as well. And I have a few that are still friends to this day. And so I had a wife at that time who was cool with all this, you know, and, and I'm doing these pictures and she works in my studio doing all the computer stuff, which we had to start doing by that time. Um, and uh, she said to me one day, she said, you know, some of these pictures are art and you're not even trying to do art. And I said, they're art? And she said, yeah, look at this. And she started showing me pictures I did. She was, that's art. And I said, no kidding. And I said, well, maybe I should try and be art. I had never tried to be an artist in my entire life. I just tried to take great photos. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I got the art thing in my head, then I went all out. Then it was like, okay, beautiful girl, tell you what, let's drive three hours north and go to Death Valley. So what if it's 126 degrees there? Let's do it. You know, and I found all these great, great locations and I was very good at posing the girls. Uh, that was what I was actually better known for. I could shave uh, 50 pounds off a girl if I wanted to, just by the way I made her stand. And, um, and that's what I did. And so I'd use them, probably about half of the girls in my book out of, it's going to be uh, 50 to 70 pictures in the book. We haven't laid that out, but I would say half of them are yeah, and uh, the you, as you're saying, the composition of the photos is part of the story. So yeah. the, the person is one thing, but the desert and then these clubs and things that are all gone. You know, majority of things you shot uh, in Las Vegas in the '90s is gone, and so yeah. the pictures really tell a story. And I think that this is something uh, you know, and this is a, a departure from the music business. You've spent. You photograph musicians forever. You photographed everything. But this is something different. And I think what makes it special is that you waited. Maybe it was just you didn't get around to it, but it works out because the 90s is this sort of interesting time. And to see things for the first time and live in that, uh, in that it, this, this book is something I think that people really enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was sort of a I never got around to a situation because... They're not in any kind of order. They're all in boxes. They're all prints. And if somebody were to say, how many photos do you have? I'd say, I don't know. There's like 40 or 50 pounds of them. That's how many I have. So that's what I'm using is those because a lot of them were um, hand printed by me. I was really, really into black and white photography. I did all my own developing, all my own printing. I hand colored the photos in some cases. And um, I absolutely love black and white. I really want to get back into doing that. Uh, and there's plans in the works for that to happen. But um, 
but purely as sort of a, you know, art, art relaxation kind of thing. No, no more business for that. You know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I eventually decided, okay, now I'm going to do it. You know, with, with the COVID thing and being quarantined, you know, as everybody was, nowhere to go. I said, well, this is a good time to do that. And so I went through all these boxes of photos and it took me about a month of just sorting through these photos and narrowing it down to which ones am I going to use? And, well, not that one. Well, that's a maybe. And we have the yes pile, the no pile, the, the maybe pile, and you know. And and so that's what I had to do. My man came here with a mess with naked pictures all over it. Could be worse. <laughs> yeah. And um, these photos are survivors, Kelly. You know, the they uh, are. Photo photos. For those who were watching who are younger, they, they, this concept doesn't mean anything. You know, they, they don't understand that you had to take a picture and develop a picture and then keep this these pictures around or and keep yeah. these negatives around because a lot of things get lost over moving and changing over the years and it's not digital. And I think that's also part of the beauty of these photos is that um, it, it, it is a, a purest look and you did this at a time. It's real. You're not recreating it now. These are authentic photos from that time. Other than the music, it was the first time I really found my art side because I didn't see a naked girl in front of me. Mm -hmm. I saw lines. I saw what's wrong. I saw what's right. And I made adjustments. And I looked at the background. And I looked at everything in my composition. And that's what I saw. I barely noticed the girl. At that point, I was so used to In fact, I'm, I'm famous for saying, too, I'm sick and tired of looking at naked girls. And mm -hmm. I, I did get to that point. It was just too much. Too I many. think anyone who's been successful in any kind of adult entertainment or anything that involves, to be successful, that's not your focus. If you're in it for, for thrills and, and women, you won't be successful in that industry. If you're in it as a business or as an artist who appreciates it, you'll have a, a longer uh run and i think that that's what this this book shows vegas the 90s nude um looking forward in the fall people can find you on social media i'm sure as we get closer you'll have a website uh you know where people can uh purchase this. I, will, I will have a website they'll be able to buy prints and books and, and all that kind of stuff and what i'm really going to go into in the book is is all about how you know i, I it wasn't a turn on there was nothing sexual about it. It was really about the art end of it. And that's how I looked at it. I, I saw it through the eyes of an artist. That's mm -hmm. what I was looking at. And and this was just a subject and a composition and the light and everything that goes into a photo, the type of film, what it's going to look like on that. I would normally shoot things with four different cameras. Um, so yeah, it, it it was an interesting experience, and, I, and that's going to be a lot of the text is, is that it wasn't about getting turned on by some girl that's naked. It, that was the last thing on my mind. Yeah, and there's obviously stories behind these photos and these locations yeah, and these people. And so I think it's going to make for a great read. Kelly, I really appreciate you spending a couple hours with me. I, I, I try to keep it short, but, you, you know, you have such a life that's worth talking about and uh, and people are interested. And I know that, you know, over the years, you've slowed down a little bit telling these same stories. So, I, I, but I think to, to a different generation, these are fresh stories and, and I think people really are happy to hear from you. And also to hear that, they're, they're, that there's new stuff coming from you as well. Yeah, I'm gonna be always working on something. You can count on that. Well, Kelly, I hope that we'll, uh, we'll see each other. We're both here in Vegas, so we'll get together and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jason. It was a great, great pleasure to see you again and to talk with you. And I just want to say one last thing, and that's thank you to all the fans out there. You know, please, 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 you know, quit bad mouth and quiet riot, man. They need a job just like you do. You know, so what? They're playing the same song. Just give them a break, man. We're, none of us are living forever. Yeah, I say that too. Like these are working musicians. I'm friends with those guys. You know, uh, know. it's people got to people got to make a living. So uh, anyway, thank you, Kelly. We'll talk again soon. All right, Jason. See you later.